Yeah, I guess I just wanted to opine on culture in general and re-emphasize the theme that I mentioned in some of my other longer recordings to maybe just make a more condensed commentary. I probably don't have the um, the eloquence to kind of go down this rabbit hole as deeply as it needs to be um, examined. This is definitely a topic that has a lot of, you know, if you can kind of get a hold of this, you can sort of see the future, I think, quite, uh, quite depressingly. Um, but the, the theme that I'm talking about is the kind of the, the token or symbolic representation of substance and authority that you know we are moving into a set of toxic conventions in which you can just kind of take a superficial reading and then you are empowered by being able to 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 sort of be able to depend on and be entitled to predicting what that narrative infers and implies so you've just kind of you've got certain prerequisite expectations that are sort of typecast into certain scripts into certain you know sort of built into certain stereotypes and as soon as you can pigeonhole someone as sort of belonging to a particular sort of co constellation of these sort of of these scripts then you're just free to kind of plug in that projection and it's quite depressing seeing you know journalism and so-called intellectuals devolve into that level of um, of, of you know of that sort of group think and jumping onto that bandwagon that you know they are they are these sort of these sacred cow narratives which sort of the chorus of everyone sort of just repetitively reiterating them creates a kind of critical mass of, of sort of assumed authority. Uh, that's obviously depressing, but um, essentially this is necessary for this kind of this new psychology, essentially, which I'll, I'll note is also sort of being I mean, people talk about technology is producing this new consciousness, which is poisonous and echo chambery or whatever. I don't think it is technology. I think it is culture. But if there is any particular platform that is doing probably the most damage, it's probably Twitter. Because um, I mean, it is only perhaps a section of the population where, you know, people who still haven't sort of come up with a kind of metacognition and a sort of meta-analysis that, you know, thinking, that thoughts, that a, a stream of sentences is always vulnerable to a kind of a never-ending argument that has no possible hope of resolution because real discussions have to have a kind of teleological iron sharpening iron you know which requires a certain level of of sort of uh, uh, having a kind of exchange and negotiation on the level of exploring let's say issues of faith because there is no objective sort of um, conventional authority that can be convened to sort of solidify claims um, that in the end all claims have to be um, understood at some point and and that I mean, there are some, let's say, basic opinions in in the Greek sense of opinion that, you know, um, could be, let's say, in inverted commas, objectively agreed on. But that that becomes somewhat meaningless uh, uh, 
when you sort of have to at some point process those basic or simple opinions into rationale. Um, into what principles are going to digest those simple opinions. Uh, which is even needed to ground the context of notions themselves. Because thinking itself is utterly meaningless unless it's given a kind of, you could call it a charity of context. And what context ultimately amount to is a faith-based uh, a system of understanding, uh, is, is a faith-based perspective. And so, you know, obviously, the question of bad faith is actually tantamount, is, is, uh, or is, 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 excuse me, is paramount. And, and the, you know, whether someone is orchestrating a kind of bad faith or a blind faith, um, that, sadly, that's a very esoteric and sort of sophisticated question, but sort of, and what we kind of suffer from is that we don't have this, a kind of a clear cultural understanding or within our general culture, we haven't gotten to the sophisticated level of like dealing in these very nuanced and, and um, potentially confusing issues of, of, you know, tracking and and seeing who is trying to pander to people based on a kind of uh you know sort of plugging into a kind of image thinking plugging into a kind of um a symbolic you know sort of equivalency that you know if you if you can just show these uh or point to to certain markers that then uh, those marks invoke a particular sort of moral authority or a kind of, um, you know, so reason itself has sort of been debased into a kind of symbolic caricature. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I, I'll, 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 let me try and make uh, the most tangible example that I can make, which is, uh, you know, in terms of judging the performance of journalists and media in general. And l let me just construct, uh, contrast Fox News to the MSNBCs and the CNNs. Uh, what was very interesting is that, uh, well, I, perhaps perhaps the contrast is, is, is cleaner, is more cleanly made in just contrasting CNN to Fox News, is that Fox News is, is not trying to claim to be an objective source of news. They are brazen about their editorial um, interpretation. They are brazen about their their faith-based position on on their values and their principles which then contextualize the notions the the thinking you know so, so that they utter so so when you're taking their thoughts you have to contextualize it within that sort of principle sort of thing cnn doesn't have principles it just it still claims to be objective so it's sort of it, it it's sort of a moral in some sense, or, or agnostic on, on principles. Um, but, I mean, in some sense, I mean, I, I would say that they also have a blind faith that is based, uh, that, that then is concealed and disguised by this kind of framing, because essentially what is happening is, you know, the, the, the narrative of identity politics is almost this basic claim that they don't have to state their principle they just have because they just have to mention what is happening they have to tell you what is the case and then 
there's a kind of you're supposed to be able to extract a prescription from what is that there's a there's a moral prescription that is perceivable just by accurately surveying what is happening or, or, or what is the case so if they tell you what the case is there's a kind of there's a natural precipitate of a moral prescription and a moral authority that that is connotated by just merely stating what is and and this is almost at the core of this really disgusting and and sadly this is how co fascistic cultures and fascistic societies that's the kind of propaganda that they use as the kind of sort of the cultural subversion that they have that essentially you just kind of get whipped along and vortexed within a kind of within the machination of the narrative within the spirit of the time you know you're just kind of uh, you're carried along by the current of history you know that's the kind of the collective destiny and you know i mean the problem is is that then because their narrative is sort of is so unprincipled but yet it has a description about reality that then can be described in order to confirm it or to validate it it's just it's this weird kind of um you know it's just basically endless table thumping but anyway the, that's actually not the contrast that i wanted to make the contrast that i want, wanted to make was that fox news because it actually reveals itself to be partisan it has to make an account of the other argument it has to kind of you know they have to phrase their partisan sentiments in a context of at least a kind of preemptive defense against the counter argument on the other side they actually have to kind of um portray the ideological opposition that they actually have to speak about the ideological opposition to their sentiment uh, uh, to, uh. so they actually have to give an account of both sides of the argument they actually have to give an account of both sides of the substance so in some sense you know it's much more transparent i mean MSNBC supposedly takes the same kind of formula as Fox News as, as being a, um, a brazenly partisan uh, uh, media house, or however they want to describe themselves, but uh, they end up doing the, same, the exact same thing as CNN, is that they just label their opposition. They just use adjectives, essentially, to defeat an argument instead of actually... Well, I, instead of stating the argument and, and countering it in a kind of, in a legitimate way, they just sort of smear, you know, um, which, you know, there, there is, there is obviously a place for satire, but essentially, you know, when, when the news and when reporting in journalism essentially became a kind of a non-stop satirical um, in you know, investigation of the opposing side, you know, which is not a real investigation. If, if you know, it, it's you know, this kind of this irreverent tone essentially is used to tone is used to. Um, supplement for the lack of substance uh, and again i mean this really has to go in terms of validating people's sense of a kind of entitlement to a moral superiority so it is this um it gets more and more sort of hyper realistic and, and sort of self-deluded um sadly but yeah, I mean, I, I think this has been the general trend which has been incubated on the so-called left for so long now that has kind of fully gestated this identity politics. Um,
And I, the most sort of depressing thing about it is that it forces people to compromise on the reading of reality at some point, because you don't want to fight about everything, and you want to be able to actually get into some kind of ideological clash so that you can start to show people that they have a different option. And so you, you, you're almost incentivized, perversely, to cede as much ground as possible to this pernicious ideology, which is so irreverent about substance just so that you can start to, to, to show a kind of choice or a kind of, you know, uh, to reveal a kind of decision that you could actually have a valid alternative judgment on, a, on, a, on the issue that the narrative would sort of shoehorn you into um, going along with and being carried by the tide of, of, of this great mechanistic fatalism that is being collectively... Um, arbitrated in which one must adopt general generalizations and and kind of nebulous reductions of reality and life into oversimplified convenient you know sort of symbolic camps and and symbolic you know kind of uh, morality in in which you can kind of conveniently project it from your subjective perch you know so, so you can just kind of you can carry it around like a briefcase and sort of just unleash it on anyone who you so wish to unleash it on. And they must give the right answers to, to the Inquisition that is then unleashed. You know, so, so they have this kind of this briefcase of moral superiority. And it's, it's too much for them to imagine going through life without this kind of this easy moral superiority which they can deploy at will and i mean that having culture be permissible to that kind of um caustic corrosive uh, uh substancelessness which confers a level of, of sort of, or endorses uh, a level of sort of personal, or the projection of a kind of personal power, leveraging, you know, cherry-picked generalizations and, 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 you know, leveraging the cause of the identity, which you can, you don't even have to have the identity, you just have to be correctly sympathetic with the identity. And so many people have have literally just fallen into that blind faith that that is how you be a good person that is how you sort of that is their ideal they 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 don't have internal values their values are external images which they have to have a kind which they have a kind of idolatry sort of you know a, a ritualistic devotion to which proves their virtuosity So they've they've tokenized virtue and and tokenized morality. Therefore, they don't have a normative morality. Um, so so these people are dangerous. I mean, they they are. I mean, I've described them as proto fascists, um, and that's exactly what they are. But uh, you know, it, it is disgusting to see just the cultural moral corruption. That this precipitates, you know, the kind of the animalistic side of it, you know, which you can really see manifesting on Twitter. It's, uh, you know, it, it, it's a, it's a weird form of self denigration, which then doubles down into excusing its own sort of indulgence in in these very sort of dark collective psychological scapegoating that is made permissible by the kind of by the groupthink by by the herd acting on this in instinct as a kind of as, as an objective moral authority that is fashioned from their sort of from the critical mass 
of just their number, you know, and and they are not willing to live in a world where they don't have this kind of this mor this this card of moral superiority, where they don't have this kind. You know, it's almost like in the Monopoly game, the metaphor is you know the get out of jail free card, that they can sort of. They have a special pleading. They have a special argument that will justify anything in in the cause of their vision, and they can indulge in any personal extravagance so long as it is covered by the umbrella of this faux uh, uh, virtue and uh, because meaning becomes even I mean it's so disgusting the, the levels of ideology that you know that they're excavating this radical imagination which which is a resource which can only be tapped into as we disrupt or as we radically uh, dismantle the system, you know, it's, it's got this um, you know, it's, it's got this weird kind of fascist poetry um, Which must also be added is is hedged all on this this kind of this agreement in that there's an external locus of control, and there's no accountability except for resisting and for being part of of this particular very convenient, very expedient or at least hypothetically expedient form of being able to hold the crimes of the system against whoever you so wish to take hostage and to and to sort of scapegoat the problems of the system you know so it's, it's this scapegoating witch hunt essentially um but yeah i mean it's interesting i, I I've, I've seen people do and say things that i mean if these were white people doing and saying these things about whiteness or about blackness they would be banned from twitter but uh you know if if you have the right superficial tokenism you know it, it's it's fine you know uh, fascism is 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 absolutely condoned so long as you are doing it uh with the right superficial window dressing or whatever, you know, it's, there's no normative values anymore in, in such a culture. It has been completely overridden. Uh, you know, there's a, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, I mean, to me, it, it's, it's depressing because, you know, it's, it's, it's like the, um, I mean, it's essentially culturally just as putrid as the apartheid government in South Africa. It's it's just as racist, you know, in terms of its morality. There is no difference now in in the current cultural hegemony. You know, it, I mean, this was the same culture generated by apartheid. This was the same rationale. You know, this kind of this fear based excuse for a kind of um, necessary racially based social cohesion and internal cohesion which is necessary because of the threat of the other or the threat of the other group which you know as soon as you kind of pub publicize that strategy and you allow that kind of propaganda you have essentially completely undermined you know the the liberal political um, paradigm of non-racialism. You know you you you've essentially uh, you've undermined non-racialism, and you and you have invoked. Uh, Uh, 
what's more to say other than, you know, it's the morality of fascism. Um, ethnocentrism. Uh, ethnocentrism. Oh, anyway, uh, tough word to say. Um, but yeah, I mean, when you, when you have people that their morality is this superficial, you can get away with any kind of propaganda. I mean, they are essentially, they're, I mean, even if they still have the framework of a democracy, it's not a democracy at that point. It's, it's a demagoguery, you know, it, it, it doesn't, when you have journalists that pander to that level of, you know, I mean, you know, it, it's disgusting. You know, there's no more journalism. It's, it's just essentially propaganda. It, it, it's just, um, it's just activism. And, you know, it's not as if journalists aren't allowed to have partisan sentiments, but, you know, hopefully you should still have to actually substantively deal with reason rather than essentially constantly trying to rely on satire. And then what's ironic is that in some sense, the so-called left, I would say, almost has to be satired to some degree because it has, it has no reasoned response to any it has no reasoned defense of any of its insanity i mean it, it's literally ludicrous it's absurd you know it's irresponsible you know it's not grown up um it's like utterly childish and you know it, it's almost it, it uses that tactic in some sense to insulate itself from having to make a substantive case for any of its, frankly, bullshit, you know, sort of uh, uh, sentiments, you know, in terms of its disgusting anti-racialist, you know, kind of stupid solutions, which don't make sense. They're just literally destabilizing because the, the overarching theme in their ideology is that destabilization is unlocking the radical imagination or something like that, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's this kind of, it's this weird kind of retributivistic generalization of, of, of social justice, where essentially social justice must be maximized before actually making people's lives better. You know, it, it's sort of social justice as it's conceived of within the so-called anti-racist movement is, is essentially a kind of, uh, uh, formulaic uh, fascistic narrative that you know sort of uh, anyway, I, I don't even but essentially you know it, it, it will almost attract criticism and then use that criticism as you know because the criticism will say oh well, look how stupid it is look how absurd it is then they'll say well you see what what they call us so that just proves our narrative even more because this is how they engage with us because they don't accept our validity. Uh, they, don't, they don't give us the dignity of believing in our subjective truth. You know, it's, it's this, this kind of this weird prattling on of, you know, essentially anyone, which it basically amounts to anyone who doesn't already agree with us is by definition racist, you know, and therefore by that tokenism, by that superficial sort of um, you know, it, it's this weird kind of thing that you can kind of that there is a single discourse that can that if if, if you can force people to use that discourse, to use that, that semantic pattern, and, and you can just force everyone to talk the same way and believe in their redefinition of reality and redefinition of words and redefinition of, of, moral, of, of morality, that if you can just force everyone to do that, then, like, the system will, in short order, you know, sort of, make the corrections that it needs to make uh, because it will create a kind of emotional break-even point in which 
there is a um, a redistribution of of identitarian pride. You know, it's it, it sort of. Uh, I mean, that's that's it's sort of it's vague. I mean, it, it's it's hard to, to to sort of it's hard to describe it because I I don't think that its adherents have conceptually thought about it that deeply, but you know that's it's sort of it's vague formulaic gist of how it it wants to kind of reorganize. Um, the effects of history, I guess you know, it's, it's all this weird kind of historical re-engineering project or excavation project where you're trying to excavate racialist pride which was lost in the historical injustice you know which is it's a it's a it's a crazy description of present reality to have this historical lens and to project it onto the present day context i mean you can do that but what why is that the causative experience explanation of perpetrating injustice of perpetu of, of, a, of a perpetualizing of injustice why is that the causative um, model of of any injustice uh, that perpetrates itself well the vague answer is is that well surely the power of retrib retributivism gives us an expedient lever to reorganize and to radically reform it gives us a kind of a moral a moral vagueness that our leadership can then do you know that they can remold society from the top down uh, when all it actually does is destroy society by essentially making it centralized around essentially government power which sadly has always had a corrupting influence but um because it's vague moral sentiments especially under under the auspices of of this sort of model and structure of treating people like tokens just dehumanizes them even more that trying to give people identitarian pride as a compensation for history doesn't solve their real problems on the ground and the idea that, oh, well, obviously the identitarian pride will only come when you also solve the problems in the ground. It's sort of, these things are completely non-related and forcing them to be conflated just so that you can indulge in a kind of redistributive revenge is a form of decadent opportunism which doesn't even result in the desired effect. You know, and, and essentially... The way that they get around this is they obsess about equality beyond everything. They say that basically, well, it doesn't matter if we're not uplifting people because at least then we're bringing other people down and therefore we're still conceptually reaching a better state of equality because even if we can't succeed in bringing people up, we're, we're making the right people uh destroyed and so that they'll they'll eventually meet each other you know it, it, it's it's that kind of insane psychopathy in, in essence even though that that whole process is hugely destructive it's hugely destabilizing on the level of just destroying capacity destroying the capacity of any society to intelligently employ policies that would actually alleviate and transform challenges and, and disadvantages that people actually have because it won't actually do the real work of let's say development and education or specifically attending to trying to do the very hard work of getting people out of cycles and patterns when you just try to scapegoat that those cycles and patterns are due to history well who cares if they who who cares what they are historically caused by that doesn't mean that that's what is causing them now. You know, it's, 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 this, it's strange that like, well, what gives the historical causation a canonical causative focus? That's just a description. 
the idea that, oh, you can only destroy something if you know historically how it came about. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Or, so the, you, you, you must then do the same thing in reverse, and then it'll undo it. No, that's not how it'll work. You know, I, I, I could probably think of a, of a metaphor if I thought about it a long time, but, you know, that's like, if you, you know, sometimes you get a huge devastating effect because a little, a little stone chipped a window. Just a, just a tiny stone created a very small crack in the window, but because it was unattended to, the, the crack grew and, until the whole uh, uh, window shattered into a million different pieces. Well, historically, it was just caused by a tiny little stone, and it could have been prevented if someone just repaired the, the little tiny scratch that, that, that then precipitated and grew into a whole network of, of faults. But the historical uh, uh, element is, is, cannot be segregated and classified under these strange generalizations of identity, which are really, I mean, they're so simplistic. It, you know, you can tell that this, the, the, this kind of racialist mentality, this kind of racialist interpretation of history is, I mean, it's like a cartoon, you know, it, it reads like Nazi propaganda, uh, talking about racial conspiracy theories. And this is problematic because it is also to misunderstand the actual, the truth of the problem as it persists in the present. The idea that you can save people's, the, the integrity of their identity while they themselves are engaged in cycles of self-disadvantage to some degree. And just say, well, no, 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 these, these cycles of self-disadvantage can never be attributed to them because it was done to them and they just have an external locus of control which society has to tackle on their behalf and that we will collectively overcome so that they will never have to develop an internal locus of control so that they can never inculcate and, and, and develop a sense of self-confidence and real self-esteem because we're just going to give them racial pride instead which will be protected by the canonical narrative that this was historically done to them and that there was no participation in their own self-disadvantage at any point. You know, so in some sense, it's, it's, it's to remove agency from human beings in order to supposedly be sympathetic to their plight. But some, what you actually do is you perpetually infantilize them by giving them a narrative that scapegoats what the real problem is so that you can have a kind of ideological clarity. You can have a kind of ideological efficiency where it's very easy to paint the world as good and bad. while also making it impossible to actually deal with the problems as they persist in the present, which take on completely different manifestations to their causal description in history. Which is, you know, it's strange because, you know, a lot of this is almost rhetorically admitted to on some level in their disgusting rhetoric of the of identity politics but they kind of they always mention it as a kind of as a way to sound more sophisticated but then they never actually actually deal with it they never actually do the work of actually attending to these issues somehow it's going to be resolved by a by a collective scapegoating that that will produce the catharsis of cleaning it up, you know, it's, uh, so it's got this weird sort of magical thinking and, and vile, simplistic rhetoric, which sounds simple and neat, but it's, you know, it's premised on these deeply racialistic, um, dehumanization, essentially, where they, they are 
indulging in this self-denigration in some sense where the victim loses all agency by their rhetoric, by their uh, conceptualization of the problem. Yeah, the, the weirdest thing is that you know they, they've got a description of the problem and they've got a description of where they want to get to, but they have no description of the intermediate step, which is why plutocrats and kleptocrats love their ideology because it just gives an open an open door to any kind of crazy inventive you know you don't have to give any kind of evidence or any kind of accounting for your visionary solution because essentially if you fail it's just a, another crime to add to the scapegoat you know there's no political accountability in the system so you know it, it, it lends itself perfectly to totalitarian regimes for anti-democratic anti-liberal forms of politics anyway it's probably gone on way too enough but i mean yeah i mean talking about all this is is just depressing because there's nothing I mean, this is sort of the extent of the problem, but, you know, I, I guess I just wanted to point out that these people that exist in this culture today, this is, this is the same culture as Weimar Germany. This is the, these are the types of people that marched in the dissatisfaction marches and the Nuremberg rallies, hand in hand, the, the communists hand in hand with, with, with the Nazis. Because they were demanding justice for their identity. They didn't want to be held accountable as an electorate. They wanted to be pandered to by a savior. That, that would give dignity to their identity, essentially. And I mean, they also had very progressive people marching. I mean, there were a lot of people who, who, in, who loved that culture. You know, they had the same... I mean, you know, they, they also had men that that had dresses there was also a whole section of sort of of radical sort of identity philosophers you know because this is part and parcel of the proto-fascist cultural phase i mean hitler would just call these people useful idiots um spreading the fascistic conception of society in in their weird moral corruption um preparing the way uh but, you know, essentially what they want can, cannot be put into politics because you cannot have a political system or a, a government that serves more than one identity. You can only have a government that serves one identity. This is why they'll always be useful idiots to, to the fascists. Um, anyway, it's depressing. I've come up with like three more ideas which I think are somewhat relevant to the whole Julius Malema or the general slide in politics and, and it's interesting like uh, you can see this in American politics as well like that the um, how there's this orthodoxy which is guarded by the mainstream media um, this, this kind of the strict conformity into uh, setting up narratives that are compatible with identitarian politics um, and sort of censoring everything that doesn't conform to that uh, that style of politics and I think this is generally representative of a slide towards unaccountable politics um, which is a kind of invariable uh, symptom and consequence and effect of the kind of illiberal morality that is disguised by the cause of the identity. Um, I, I, I go into this when I in my recording where I talk about generalizations um, and non-racialism um, and and the kind of the toxic. Um, ideology that is right in the terminology of of identity politics that, that sort of as the, these kind of these hidden philosophical premises um, you 
Anyway, uh, let, let me get to these three basic ideas. Um, so, I guess the the way that I see that their orthodoxy and dogma grows and sort of bullies people into conformity. Um, is because of the huge costs that is associated or which is imposed for disagreeing with it. And also the kind of the authoritarianism which is which the kind of which which the orthodoxy is kind of premised on, that at some point it requires a kind of representative of a consensus to dictate what the new words mean because there's so much sort of philosophical incoherence and kind of moral pliability because the whole system is basically worked uh, worked from extracting an ought from an is that you don't have to make a normative uh, um, you don't have to have a way of thinking that is reasoned and grounded in a kind of normative morality instead you have a kind of hysterical caustic demand and complaint which is leveraged against the system and against a scapegoat that must represent the system and because of you know using generalizations in the way that it does and leveraging um, this kind of cherry-picked toxic narrative that can be deployed against targets um, you know in, in these weird kind of, weird kind of ideological witch hunts um, because essentially there is so much token representation in the moral symbology that the, that the whole system is, is, is essentially it has to be directed. Someone needs, needs to direct the symbolism and someone has, you know, it's sort of like it, it's a destruction of normal politics on, on a wide scale. Um, you know, it's it sort of, it's all leveraged on, on simply not having to debate the substance, not having to debate policy, not having to defend policy because you can just, Essentially, instead of defending policy, you can just kind of character assassinate anyone who ostensibly disagrees with you by impugning their integrity for having the gall of even wishing to disagree with you and not taking you as being representative of the, of the kind of sanctimonious cause of the identity. So essentially, it's a kind of, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a weird kind of cultural totalitarianism that kind of deploys a weird kind of mockery, a weird kind of s satire that gets more and more lazy about not even having to connect a rationale for why its kind of mockery of its, of its opponents should pertain. You know, it doesn't have to prove its argument against its opponents. And in some sense, the less it has to prove its argument, the more it kind of inculcates and... Um, grows the sense of kind of automatic trust that they have a kind of that that they have cornered the market of the moral high ground that they have um assumed and 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 successfully hold the default moral supremacy essentially and so the less they have to actually make their case the less they have to actually respond to challenges the, the stronger they are symbolically within what is already a kind of symbolic narrative. And so then they get away with kind of usurping everyone's reality and being able to kind of toy with language even because suddenly they become the arbiter of what the ordinary meaning of words are. You know, they kind of, they change the meaning of words underneath people. And if people don't follow this new fashion and fad of how this word is now infused with subjective layers of meaning which are kind of dictated by this kind of this moral consensus uh, uh, you know it's, it's you know uh, Brett Weinstein calls it the decentralized revolution and I think that that's another way of describing that it's basically that it's that it's a totalitarian ideological narrative and that is why it's capable of being decentralized but still being, but still be totalitarian. And I mean, essentially, the, the culture is a kind of the proto-fascist 
vanguard of of you know the, the kind of the Martin Bailey um, uh, uh, element to to how fascism creeps in and takes over a culture uh, as 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 the the proto fascism in the culture heralds and is the harbinger for for the the destruction of political accountability um, because politics becomes essentially virtue signaling your uh, facilitation of the ideological narrative of, of your agreement to the ideological narrative of going along with the flow of, of being carried along with the current um, with this decentralized consensus of you know of whatever the new language reinterpretation is and and which has you know a lot of it's interesting that as well like uh, and, and I, I believe I've described this in, in, in my previous recordings um, that, you know, a lot of its tactics is about sort of shifting the burden of proof by essentially what it is doing, it accuses its opponents of doing. So basically it says that it is not, it, it, is, it has not unfairly usurped uh, the kind of the, dof, the, the default moral supremacy and, and kind of claiming a kind of dogmatic, you know, uh, claim of, of self-righteousness. It, it, it says that that's what its opponents have done, that its opponents have, you know, sort of um, have tried to undermine its, its genuine and authentic claim, you know, and, and there's really no easy way to arbitrate who is correct, except that they are the ones actually making the complaint first, or, or at least, uh, you know, that th th they start off by maligning their opponents as almost a substitute for credibility for, you know, so it's, it's essentially it's like, oh, you should be sympathetic with our cause because we have been the underdog for so long. And that's just, you know, part of their spiel. That's just part of their narrative. And so they kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of like a, an emotional induction. But um, and so unless I think that you actually have to match its tone of argument. You have to match its style, but then you have to do something extra, and that is you have to you have to make the same kind of stark claims, but you actually have to have reason and a coherent web and a coherent understanding of all the issues that that puts them in order to show that essentially that your claim against them is actually substantive and their claim is just a kind of hollow repetitive whining of just, you know, of reiterating a lie so many times that people believe that it's true and people are bullied into kind of not even showing the other side of the argument. But I think that it is it is necessary to engage the argument on the same tone that they are making their argument. I, I think that because otherwise you're not going to overcome essentially the... Um, the accusation of bad faith that they that their whole worldview is premised on that, that their whole politics is premised on uh, on this weird kind of scapegoating and then they can get away with not having to substantiate their own policy uh, of not having to, to prove and and give hard evidence for their own claims because it's just it's carried by their hysterical moral language and their abuse of morality and their and their corruption of uh, um, and displacement of, of, of normative values and ethics. And it is very hard to to match that tone and to to wear the many hats that one has to to, to shift between in order to thoroughly debunk them because you know the the kinds of dishonest tactics that they do, does require, let's say, a certain development of kind of rhetorical technology in order to um, convincingly uh, uh, debunk them. You know, you, you, it, you know, you, I mean, I, I, I've, I've tried to, to outline <clears throat> some useful general sort of tools, which is that you should paraphrase what they say. You, you should translate what they say into a kind of so, so as to crystallize their destruction of morality, that, that, that you should translate what they say in their narrative rhetoric into a kind of, into the unintended consequences that they are actually affecting and which they are pretending to not be cognizant of so that they can essentially use that 
secondary failure as more fuel for their moral hysteria and their moral panic, you know. So they've got this, you know, to somewhat to, to, to put them on notice for their unintended consequences and put their unintended consequences to them and, and essentially um, infuse moral accountability or at least uh, political accountability back into normal politics. And essentially, it, that you do need to make the broader claims. You can't just make that. You also have to frame the argument as well and, 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 and describe the themes that this is a fascistic slanting of politics that are, is destroying normal politics and is destroying political accountability. That is almost one of the major legs of the argument that you have to make is that first of all you're destroying political accountable because you're fundamentally corrupt uh, and, and you've corrupted many things and so you, you link the concept of political unaccountability to their hysterical moral panics which then link it to um, the unintended consequences which they willfully ignore because it's not part of their narrative vision. It, it's not captured by the cause of the identity, but it is part of reality because essentially they're just full of ideological lies, essentially, um, and ideological conveniences. You know, the, 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 they, they are dependent on a form of ideological convenience. Um, They're addicted to sort of growing this ideological convenience, and they do it by, by essentially mocking their opposition. So essentially when they dismiss and they don't substantively deal with the, their unintended consequences, then you say, well, you see, you, you d dismiss your opposition because you can't deal in reality. You know, you have to, that's the kind of the level of summation that you have to get to um, in retorting to their style of politics. You know, it requires a kind of a metaphysics, it, it requires a kind of agile metaphysics of being able to put on the kind of the hat of, of morality, the hat of moral language to reorder and to reframe and to um, contest their very, you know, kind of intellectually dishonest and pseudo-intellectualism that props up, you know, their, their kind of mindless screeching and their, you know, the they're kind of they're very fakely generated moral panic, you know. It's a, it's it's an orchestrated, um, cynical grab towards accumulating more political unaccountability because you can just transfer political unaccountability into a divisive, racialistic. Uh, uh, you know, sort of demagoguery and, and narrative, uh, which completely absolves, you know, actually having to fix the problems on the ground, um, from actually having to compare policies that worked and policies that made things worse. And then instead of actually having the political accountability for being blamed for making a bad policy choice, instead you just leverage the, the, the identity narrative stuff you just inflame the identity narrative stuff and, and and that's what you use essentially and it's um it's embarrassing or it's not only embarrassing it's toxic it's destructive to politics it's just destructive to accountable politics and i think that 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 is the kind of wedge that you need in order to actually put their style of politics under the kind of inspection the kind of invigilation that is required in order to debunk their um, very superficial, symbolic form of politics, which is essentially uh, uh, removes responsibility, removes political ownership from bad policy, uh, and and it and it makes policy debate essentially it deflates policy debate, it destroys democratic politics, it destroys liberal democratic open politics, it, politics becomes an opaque symbolic you know, populist, uh, 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 you know, disgusting, you know, and, and they must be called kind of cynical populists that are driving cynical popular, uh, that are driving populism cynically in order to manufacture yet more political unaccountability. Because if they were actually, if, if their policy did actually have to answer for its own effects and its unintended consequences, um, 
you know, they would be laughed at. But the only way to, to not be laughed at is to invent a moral panic, it is, is to invent issues and to frame issues dishonestly so as to be convenient for their ideological uh, um, political accountability, their, their ideologically entrenched and buttressed political unaccountability. And this is fascist politics. And so, you see, th these arguments are a bit dry. And you, the only way to actually make them forcefully is to call it what it is. This is, the, this is the slow cook of a democracy into a fascistic tyranny, into unaccountable politics, into the destruction of normal politics, uh, the, the destruction of a functioning democracy. And it is not... That's, it, it's how it must be framed. And it's also true. It's the only way that it's going to, you know, th that the issue is going to be properly, it, 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 it's the only way that you're actually going to confront the, you know, and, and I mean, there's a lot to be said here, because even the president and the hopefulness that people had with the new president, even he can't go against this political unaccountability uh, um, level of, of, of racialistic pandering in his own party. And this is the slow cook of democracy. And it's not just the EFF. It's a large contingent of the ANC because they need it. They know that they ideologically need it to get away with the things that they get away with. And so this is, this is a, a, a broad thing that must be addressed within politics. Otherwise, you know, there's no hope of, of, of getting a handle of this. Because, I mean, you know, I mean, there are also other elements to this, which is essentially, I mean, the, the kind of the betrayal of constitutional values which is promulgated by academia by the diffusion and the and the takeover you know in in history departments and sociology departments that treat uh, that, that teach this racialistic um cause of the identity as a kind of as a as a morally uh, uh compatible way of 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 thinking about issues you know is you know and the pseudo-intellectualism and how it's spread like a cancer um You know that eventually is going to have to be addressed, and we're never going to get to the point of cleaning that stuff up if we can't even address it in the political sphere uh, until political and moral leadership is developed, so that the, so that the problem can actually be properly framed, so that something might be done about it. Otherwise, it's just it's going to be a losing battle. It's just going to be a, a slow motion train wreck. Um, which is what we are currently in the midst of. Um, and I, I think people know, so I mean, I think that the political unaccountability must actually become the wedge, will become the main focus, I think, of reframing the, the, the political problems in this country, at least. Um, but also to reframe politics back around what normal politics entails, what normal democratic debate looks like. And if we don't sort of name the elephant in the room, the fascistic slanting and, and slide towards unaccountable politics, um, yeah, I mean, anyway, I've, I think it, there, there was maybe one more idea around this, but um, yeah, I guess just, just focusing on their on their rhetorical tactics of how they essentially use this mockery where they don't get into substantive debates defending their policy and how they instead leverage this moral panic around racialism and these racial symbolic things which allow for kleptocratic um, uh, usurpation of, you know, uh, you know it, it, I mean, essentially... Even if you have the form of institutions, the institutions become teethless and hollow because you've got this uh, cultural hegemon and, and this disgusting morality which, which blunts them and makes them useless. Um, I mean, you can see how even this orthodoxy bends the ear or bends the, uh, the judgments of the chief justice himself. Uh, who has polluted, essentially, the rule of law with this ideological um, excuse that, well, if you just have the right vision, then the unintended consequences, and you can give people unaccountability as you so choose, because 
their heart is in the right place. Uh, you know, I, I, I think this comes across very clearly um, in my uh, critique of the Chief Justice and how he spoke in favour of the um, of the public prosecutor uh, and essentially shielded the public prosecutor for not being responsible for briefs that are um, issued by her own office, you know, and, and, and so somehow the, the public prosecutor is not even responsible for briefs that uh, 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 and legal arguments that are made on behalf of the office of the public uh, prosecutor, you know, that's what the what the role entails is making the right precedent and making the right legal arguments. And if she can't even be expected to have the buck stop with her in her office, then she shouldn't be the public prosecutor. You can't infantilize the public prosecutor. I mean, it's a legalistic uh, office, you know, and, and, and you're going to say, well, no, no, arguments made, uh, if she took uh, uh, advice from counsel, she can't be responsible for, for for the cases made on behalf of her office uh, uh, after taking advice from counsel because she just took the advice. You know, I mean, this is to infantilize the public prosecutor because of this ideological bias. Um, you know, I mean, this is just, this is, this is how unaccountable politics uh, functions. Okay, well, that's, that's, a, that's the kind of the conceptual nutshell of it. And you can see it, you know, sort of in the worst place. I mean, that, that Obviously, it's going to happen in politics if it happens in, in a judicial setting, you know, uh, where principles are supposed to be followed and, and you know, uh, nuanced understandings. Of, and you can just see how the corrupt morality has seeped into corrupting the judiciary. Um, well, not the whole judiciary, but, I mean, sadly, uh, uh, you know, if, if, those, if those kinds of sentiments can be issued by the so-called chief justice... Well, I mean, he is the Chief Justice, but I mean, the reason, I, I, I don't like the title Chief Justice. I mean, that was created after all these things were created. It did not need to be created. Um, the President of the Constitutional Court was good enough, and that actually kept the right separation between the executive. You know, so, so now when the President is being sworn in, it's being sworn in by the President of the Constitutional Court because he is now called the Chief Justice. No, it was much better... That, that that it was the president or, or the or the, the the leading judicial officer in 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 the appellate division, because I don't want to see the con I, the constitutional court judge should not be buddy buddy with the executive should not be smiling and, and signing someone no, they are supposed to be above that actually they're supposed to be above the executive. They they're not supposed to get into the mecha the, the mechanical they're not some kind of mechanical office facilitator of, 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 of democracy. They're supposed to be governing the Constitution and, and, and promulgating the values of the Constitution and presiding over important matters. They're not supposed to be doing little functionary roles. You know, it, it, it's a disgusting form of symbolism. I mean, it, it, I mean, it just shows the... the I mean... I haven't made the argument so eloquently, but I mean, it's just, it's a travesty. The whole thing is a, is a travesty. I mean, it's now, it's all about, I mean, you can see that how these people are obsessed with it, just maintaining their racialistic pride and, and how politics has now become subservient, essentially, to this disgusting project of, of conserving, maintaining, and promoting equal racialistic pride. That's what social justice has come to mean, not, not justice for the individual, uh, that might be disadvantaged, that, that needs policy targeted at them. No, no, no. It's, it's, a, it's about something symbolic. It's about something greater than that. It's about a disgusting racialist moral system. Yeah. I mean, these, these people, they need to have their disgusting morality underlined as, as fascistic as, and, and as uh, destroying and betraying the values of the South African Constitution. But, I mean, we can't get to that if we can't get... A level of moral leadership exemplifying and confronting um, and crystallizing you know the, the depth of depravity that 
Okay, this recording has been a, a bit of a... Uh, perhaps went a bit too quickly, but I just... Sorry, I just wanted to add in some, some of these themes, I guess, to the end of, of, of what I was saying. But um, I'm just going to tack this on to the end of what was already... Oh, two hours then, I guess. Uh, I quickly just need to correct uh, two errors that I just made. I mean, I, I was literally trying to make a very fast recording because I just wanted to conceptually tie off some loose ends. And um, usually I don't make recordings while I'm sitting at my desk, but I just wanted to kind of put all this out there. So um, I made a, a huge uh, clerical sort of, uh, well, it's, I guess it's, it's more than a clerical error, but every time I said public prosecutor, I was completely wrong. It's public protector. And that was just kind of a slip of the tongue, which was a mistake that I made consistently, which is a bit embarrassing. But yeah, so I was actually, every time I said public prosecutor, I meant to say public protector. Um, and uh, for people that don't know, like when I'm, when I'm talking about the new president, I'm talking about Cyril Ramaphosa, I'm talking about political parties that exist within the South African political context um so I, I just thought i'd uh just state that plainly um but yeah i mean i i you can tell in that last 26 minute bit i was just trying to get through substantive issues quite quickly and give a certain gist of things i didn't very carefully lay out my arguments but i think i did get some of the sentiments across and in fact let me take this opportunity to just emphasize some things because when i was re-listening to that recording um I think I actually, I skipped over some opportunities to also say that the moral panic itself is based on racialistic immor immorality, that it's based on a, on a racialistic, it, it's based on racist sentimentality. And you, you can't expect to have a good functioning political environment when it's based on, you know, like prejudice, essentially. It's, it's based on sort of a kind of blind hatred it's, it's based on leveraging presumptions into the process of thinking about issues and when you have that kind of imprecise you know kind of uh, 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 sort of convenient conjecture and speculation which you're allowed to indulge in because it's been you know sort of enshrined by this disgusting you know sort of uh, uh, identitarian ideology of the of the cause of the identity you know that, that doesn't stop it from being racist it, it's full of racist generalizations and it is actually hurting the people the most that it supposedly is meant to be helping. It's undermining the people that it's meant to be helping, which is, you know, it's ironic that essentially it's meant to be racist against people, but it's actually racist in some sense in, in, a, in a generally destructive way. You know, in some sense you can say, well, it's also hurting white people because they have to leave the country or, or, or they, you know, they can't get on by their life is made more difficult. And so it's the kind of, well, virtually uh, it's helping equality because relativistically it is causing damage. It's causing, you know, sort of hurt. And so you've got this kind of retributivistic logic that's based within it that, well, as long as you can hurt white people, then simultaneously you're promoting equality towards black people somehow. When in, in fact, you're actually just generally destabilizing and hurting a situation and making it more dysfunctional, making it less able to grow. And so there's no opportunity that can actually be, um, you know, in some sense, you know, when you've got negative growth, you can't expect for an economy or a society to be very transformative when it's busy shrinking. When it's busy shrinking, there's no capacity in which that there can actually be transformation because everything is, is based on a kind of how little can you lose because it, because nothing is growing. Nothing is, is uh, um, or so little, you know, or relatively, uh, generally speaking, things are contracting, you know, so, so a contracting society, um, a beleaguered and failed, failing society is, is not one that has the capability to transform at all. And so we can't even test if the new South Africa would have been successful or not because it's been derailed so, so soon.
after its ignition, or after its beginning. Um, it's been undermined um, cynically and opportunistically by essentially political parasites that have insulated themselves using racialistic morality. Uh, anyway, so, 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 so that I think is how the polemic needs to be framed. But I mean, when I, when I go into to talking about the Chief Justice, I think that that is a prime example of, um, especially with the public protector, uh, if you, I've got a recording that's just on that, that kind of explores that notion of essentially shielding people from essentially unintended consequences and essentially giving them political unaccountability as a kind of consolation prize, as, as, as this is how essentially identity politics works. It works by generating a kind of unearned sympathy that just de creates destabilization, that creates lower standards, that creates chaos, essentially. And essentially it just blames whatever deficit there is on, on some kind of ideological scapegoat, and it just reinforces the narrative. Yeah, we live in a, in a failing state, and, and we know who to blame for that, and so there's never any accountability for fixing it. You know, it, it's, uh, you know, it's just toxic and poisonous and, and having someone who who is called the chief justice who is um a mouthpiece for that kind of vile uh, uh garbage uh, uh you know which undermines the spirit and the values of a liberal democracy and is actively corroding it and destroying it it's um it's a travesty but i mean you know th that that is something that i mean i don't know when at what i mean that has to be politically confronted at some point but uh, but perhaps at the same time that education is looked at but that that is not even going to be possible unless um, the political argument is first made in the political arena and we get some kind of moral leadership on, on, on these um, uh, uh, some kind of template that is provided by a political platform I think is needed in order for culture to to um, to reaffirm uh, uh, liberal values um, so that we can have political accountability back. Because obviously democracy is just... I mean, I, I would say that, you know, the, in some sense the actual, the actual proximate problem here is journalism because journalism has essentially dropped the ball on this because it doesn't have any integrity. It doesn't have any sort of structural morality under, underpinning it. It's, it's just fallen for the racialist garbage it's for because it's calls it because it, it it just you know well if someone claims to be for anti-racism you know it's like they they don't have any way to kind of to scratch the surface you know the, the, because uh they're just uh, addicted to sensationalism they're, they're addicted to to sort of buzzword laden um sensationalist headlines you know it, it, it's it's just that kind of um you know they they don't want to deal with the problem of of talking points that you know like can't, that are confronted with with a kind of um slash and burn ideology like identity politics you know they essentially just have to go along with it uh because they are um essentially vacuous morally um destitute you know uh, or, or morally feeble individuals themselves you know that the, the kind of um you know, they're not centered in morality they're more centered in their idea of themselves as having high status for being seen as being intellectually sophisticated you know they're they're, they're used to trading on kind of symbolism of of um of pseudo intellectual you know i this has been a tendency that I've that I've spoken about before about journalism. I, I think that it, it, journalism does have this kind of this. It does have an appeal to people who should not be journalists essentially because they are kind of they they, they see themselves as being like intellectual field marshals because it, it's kind of you know you can always excuse yourself. Well, I'm not making a case. I'm just commenting on what is happening. That's why I have to talk about this because it's currently what is happening. It should be in the news because it is what is happening. And I just put a slight spin on it. And then if my spin is slightly off, I can just say, you know, I can just modify it, you know. So you can, get, it allows people to kind of drip feed the idea that they are kind of, you know, controlling social 
sentiment, you know. So it, it kind of has, the, you know, it, it's, it's this very kind of, um, you know, I mean, which got, you know, which has now become the character of the industry, you know, of, of this kind of activism. Um, perhaps it's slightly better because before it was concealed and now it's sort of like brazen that these people are like, you know, they're wearing partisan shirts and, and ideological flags, uh, you know, so now that kind of, now the pseudo-intellectualism is, is kind of, and, and I, in, in some sense I do think that, that this is why democracy has always been weak, is because of journalism, and so in some sense maybe this does contextualize and frame um, the the true stumbling block to having a, a, a really enlightened and progressive democracy that is capable of actually getting it, getting work done and, and you know, uh, uh, cont contending with its business responsibly, um, you know, and fulfilling its duties and, and all that. Um, so hopefully if we can come out of the culture wars with perhaps a solution to journalism, which, I mean, I think... I think the solution will be decentralization, will be a kind of something like YouTube and and sort of um, people like Timcast. I think Timcast or Tim Pool is the kind of, that is what, like, uh, I think that's a much healthier model for people to have uh, comprehensive worldviews that are coherent and that are tested and that you have somewhat mini intellectual celebrities that represent certain ideas and ideologies and that you see them argue with other people and then you so so there's a kind of there's a more organic um, way of seeing the 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 intellectual arena and then there's a there's a better access of, of choice making but I mean obviously in the current form it's very toxic because you know identity politics is so totalitarian and so fascistic that it cannot it cannot bear the scrutiny of you know the light of of real investigation the right of, of uh, the light of, of real um, uh, uh, you know of, 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 of having it exhibited honestly and in, in a fair contest of ideas it's not capable of doing that it, it's only capable of if it's chairing the debate you know if it's controlling a kind of orthodoxy and a kind of you know being the chair of its being the arbiter of its own um, sort of it has to be the arbiter of its own controversy you know and it has to drown out the you know it has to distort the framing of reality in order to kind of get away with itself which is um, and to cut through that you know is a uh, um, is something that does take a bit of courage certainly um, because you know, until those measures are discovered and publicized, or at least break through the narrative or break through the cracks of the of the dogma and the orthodoxy, um, we're not going to see examples of um, of, of of getting this this monstrous uh, fascistic slide uh, behind us. You know, we're not going to get a handle on it. Um, we're not going to be able. To suppress its its sa sadly its slow cook and take over um, because it's ready in the institutions. That's the thing is that we're kind of we're we're really behind. Uh, uh, you know, the, I mean, how much generational propaganda do you think that this younger generation is going to absorb and um, and be salvageable? You know, are we going to have to live with a generation? Of people that will never essentially have an internal locus of control, that will never be responsible, that will always uh, translate all of their problems into a kind of identitarian filter and projection onto people and the kind of extracting uh, this disgusting form of ideological form of narcissistic supply essentially. Anyway, I'm not going to get into all the repetition. But, you know, it's, uh, are we going to really going to deal with a generation of fascists and uh, or essentially racists that will never be curable of their racism? I mean, it's going to be terrible. Um, perhaps a lot of them will be recovered if we can manage the culture, if we can win the culture back. But uh, uh, some of, 
I mean, some people are just naturally prone to these ways of thinking. I mean, the only way that we got to the level of non-racialism that we had in society was because we had a moral, because we taught that morality in school. You know, uh, uh, there was a lot of concerted effort put into making a decent society with a decent morality, and that work has been undermined by historians, by sociologists, in academia, and they have um, corrupted uh, a generation of teachers, and those teachers have been infusing this disgusting morality into their children uh, that they have been teaching, you know, and yes, there will be children that will have resisted it because they would have seen the travesty before their very eyes, they would have seen the moral corruption before their very eyes. Um, I wonder. So hopefully there's a silver lining, I guess, but there's the, the fights that need to be conducted and you know the, the cultural war uh, needs needs to start getting a, a, a deeper political voice um, and and cutting through the their hyper sentimental. Uh, hyper-realism and, and distortion of reality and morality. 